Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Military Veterans in the Legal Field, a panel discussion. For this webinar, attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you need technical assistance, please submit your request under the Tech tab in the window in the top right-hand corner of your computer screen. Welcome. I am Bart Stitchman, co-founder and executive director of the National Veterans Legal Services Program, or NVLSP for short. Thank you for joining us today for our amazing panel, Military Veterans in the Legal Field. NVLSP is a high-impact nonprofit organization that has worked since 1981 to ensure that the government delivers to our nation's 22 million veterans and active duty personnel the benefits to which they are entitled because of disabilities resulting from their military service to our country. For over four decades, NVLSP is ensuring, has been ensuring that our nation keeps its promise to care for those who served our country in the armed forces. Our work has evolved through our four core programs, individual representation, class actions, training and publications, and our pro bono program, Lawyers Serving Warriors. Law firms and corporate legal departments generously volunteer their time to help us defend veterans' rights through our pro bono program. Several of our distinguished panelists today are among these volunteers. Many of them are veterans themselves and they will share their firsthand insights. In the discussion, the panel will highlight the unique value of military veterans' knowledge, experience, and expertise to the legal field. They will explore the value that veterans' military service brings to their firm or corporation. They will also discuss the veterans' resource groups and forums that many firms and corporations provide for their military veterans. If you would like to learn more about NVLSP, we hope you will visit our website at www nvlsp.org or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Again, thank you for joining us today for our panel, Military Veterans in the Legal Field. Now, I would like to introduce the moderator for today's panel, Esther Liebfarth. She is a senior staff attorney in NVLSP's pro bono program, Lawyers Serving Warriors. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion. Welcome everyone to our fabulous panel discussion today, Military Veterans in the Legal Field. As Bart mentioned, I'm Esther Liebfarth. I'm a senior staff attorney at NVLSP. I'm also a military spouse and have the pleasure of working with colleagues who are themselves veterans each day. I know everyone is ready to head straight into the questions and hear from our distinguished panelists. I will let them introduce themselves. Ben, shall we start with you? Great, thanks, thanks Esther. I'm Ben Block. I'm a partner at Covington and Burling in Washington, DC, where my practice focuses on civil litigation. Uh, I've been at Covington ever since a clerkship following uh, law school at the University of Virginia. Prior to law school, I, was, uh, I had a very brief and undistinguished to, uh, career as an armor officer. Great to meet everybody, see everybody. Who's next, Beth? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, my name is Beth Farrell. I am a partner at the law firm of Finnegan, uh, which is a uh, IP law firm located in Washington, DC. And I graduated from the Air Force Academy and I served for five years as a communications officer before I went to law school. Hi. I'm Will Gunn. I'm the general counsel for the Legal Services Corporation. I spent 25 years in the Air Force, and during that time, most of it was spent as a JAG. I went to school through what's called the Funded Legal Education Program. When I retired from the Air Force, I my first job was as the CEO of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Washington. Then I opened my own law practice and uh, after a while, I got a chance to serve in the Obama administration as the general counsel for the Department of Veterans Affairs. And um, 
in the last few years, I served as uh, on my own, my own law practice, and also doing some consulting. So happy to be with you all today. Hi, and I'm Amy Walborn. I am a Associate General Counsel at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, where I support the US public sector business and the high performance compute business. Um, law is sec my second career. I was commissioned in the Navy through the NROTC program at the University of North Carolina. I was a Naval Flight Officer and a Mission Commander in two different aircraft. Worked for the Office of Sex Defense and as a social aide at the White House. I um, went to law school at night and so I had an overlap of my active duty career and my reserve career and eventually retired out of the reserves um, after 20 years of service. And I've spent some time in a law firm doing civil litigation and government contracts litigation. Also at the Navy Office of General Counsels, working for the spending and barring official. And then now I've been at Hewlett Packard Enterprise for about five and a half years. Thank you so much for those introductions. We certainly have an accomplished set of panelists. So I imagine that many of the people who have registered for this discussion are veterans thinking about going to law school. So I'd like to start by asking a few of the veterans on the panel to explain why they chose the legal profession. Ben, would you kick us off? Sure, and and for those for those watching who are who are veterans, maybe thinking about law school, good on you, and good on you for traveling what what I think still remains the road relatively less traveled among among veterans. I, I'm a lawyer because I did better on the LSAT than I did on the GMAT. I knew that I wanted to go to uh, grad school, and uh, I remember getting back from a National Training Center rotation. We went in July. That's a great time to go to the NRTC. Um, and I'd taken the LSAT right, right, right before that, and and so that that's that's what made the decision for me. But I I actually uh, in my military career, one of probably my favorite job that I had in the army was as the, an S1, an adjutant for a armor battalion, and I liked the I liked uh, working on legal ish type stuff, reports of survey, uh, you, you know, um, I'm trying to think some of the other. Uh, analyses we had to do. I got to work with some of the, the JAG officers in that role, and it got me thinking about law school. I had a younger brother who was in law school, and I thought if he was liking it, uh, I would like it. People told me I like to talk a lot, and so I should be a lawyer, and so that's what I did. So I can go next. I, uh, I thought about, so I knew when I got out of the service that I didn't want to go work for a defense contractor. I basically didn't want to continue to do my same job just in the defense contractor role. And so I, uh, I thought about business school, but I sort of had a misunderstanding about business school. I thought you had to have an idea to start a business and I didn't have an idea. So it seemed like law school made sense. Um, and I, uh, I was really, frankly kind of looking for a bit of a break after having gone to the academy and then having served for five years i sort of like the idea i went to carolina and i like the idea of being in chapel hill for three years that seemed like a fun thing to do um of course the very first day i showed up i met the dean and he said what did you do and i told him and he said oh so you're going to be a patent lawyer right and i said well what do you say that and he said well you have two technical degrees and you have all this technical experience that must be what you're going to do and um you know, patent firms were hiring and I really like my law firm. And so I kind of fell into patent law, I think. I don't know that I was necessarily uh, destined to do it. I don't have any lawyers in my family. So, uh, you know, it, it just sort of made sense at the time. Um, and I guess that's one thing I would say to the folks who are listening, if you are interested in going to law school, don't think you have to stick with a particular type of law. I think you can explore what's out there and you might find that there's something that you're interested in that might be very different than what you did in the service and that, that could be very fulfilling. Thank you, Beth. And as a follow-on question, um, what unique skills and attributes do lawyers or even other legal staff have who are veterans and you know how do they contribute those skills and attributes to the legal field and um, Beth I'm going to go back to you yeah sure 
Um, so I think there's a couple of them that I didn't even realize I had. One is um, I'm a pretty organized person. I know how to break down a problem. I know how to set a schedule. I know how to keep to the schedule. Shockingly, this is not a skill that a lot of other people necessarily have. And when you have that skill, all of a sudden you're seen as this like super productive and, and com um, uh, competent person. Even though for me, I'm like, well, I'm just kind of breaking it down. So I think that's one thing. Um, I learned that in the military and that's really served me well. The other is, is supervisory skills. Um, I'm actually pretty good at being somebody's supervisor, you know, giving them expectations, checking in, giving them feedback. These are all things that I think your standard lawyer may not really have that much experience with. And so I think that having those supervisory skills and then being a good supervisor means that people want to work with you and means that you can be in charge of more interesting work because the really interesting work does require sort of more than one person to do it. So um, I know we've talked about some of the positive um, parts of going from veteran status into the civilian status or service member to civilian. What was the most difficult thing, though, about transitioning from the military to the civilian sector? And what can veterans and the firms and organizations that hire them do to lessen those challenges? Will? Well, for me, I didn't go directly into a law practice out of the military, in contrast to others on this panel. My military career was as, as a lawyer. And so if I could just circle back to, to a couple of things. Uh, I, I see lawyers as bringing to the table uh, problem solving skills, uh, as well as the leadership slash management skills that uh, others, others have talked about. And those have been uh, very, very positive. In, in terms of what others can do to help with the transition, I think the the biggest thing is that the military tip, I found the military to do a good job with respect to, uh, I would say mentoring and uh, and just hand hand holding to a certain extent. Uh, and so because it can be a great cultural shift going from a military uh, environment to a civilian environment, regardless of what it may be, but particularly in the in the legal field, having uh, good mentoring programs put up, uh, put in place, so that people can have folks that they can that they can talk to about the issues that arise. I think that's invaluable. And as a follow-on question, um, have you seen any of these mentor programs in your own careers? Any of the panelists, or you will, and what attributes happen to be? successful in that respect? I, I've actually found that the informal mentoring programs were the most most successful and the ones that I, that I gravitated toward. And so I think from a from a leadership perspective, either in a firm, a corporation, uh, wherever it might be, it's just important that there are frequent check-ins and that uh, folks aren't left, left trying to figure out uh, what it is that they need to be doing to be successful in, in that environment. So uh, while I tend to gravitate toward informal men mentoring, I think the organization can do a lot by at least having a, a, a buddy, a, a peer, or someone there that's put in place that can uh, work, with the, uh, work with the veteran to help them to figure out the new environment. Thanks so much, Will. I, okay, Amy, go ahead. Were you going to go? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, our company has a veterans employee resource group that um, before when we were in offices, they would have events in person in offices or they we've, you know, taken it virtual. And I think that's outside of legal specifically. It's com it's company wide. But I do think those I see more and more of that happening. And I think it's a great resource. The other thing is just don't be afraid to network with any veterans you see. Um, when I was coming out of law school, I looked at law firms bios to find veterans and sent them letters. And even if they weren't hiring, I got a network built up of people that I they could look to. So that's another thing. Abs and absolutely. 
absolutely do that. And and I, I said I I said it's I think it really still is a road less traveled for folks from service to the law. There are it's still there, there are more and more folks doing it, but it's still relatively rare. Re, look, reach out to um, folks you see who have who have done that. People are happy to talk. One one way that can be helpful. Um, I'm not sure this is a necessarily a challenge of transitioning from military to to the law, but but in terms of your get your resume uh, and and encapsulating on your resume what you did in service and how that um, the, the, the parts of that will that, that will most resonate with with legal employers and some of that is just trying to beat the military jargon out of out of you which is it takes a long time uh, Lord knows I still do phonetic alphabet when I'm spelling my name court reporters think that that's odd I don't understand why everybody doesn't do phonetic alphabet but but trying to um, because what you did in service, I guarantee that something you probably a whole lot of what you did in service translates really well into into the practice of law. It's but you got to translate it to people who have never been in the service so they understand. You, you know, the, if it's the leadership aspect of it, if it's the uh, the, the high stress environments in which you worked, uh, certainly the folks folks coming in uh, from service today almost invariably have been places and done things under under extremely stressful circumstances if you can get through that you're gonna you know the stresses of the daily workplace grind are gonna be gonna be nothing but but it's it's translating it I you know not saying s1 say personnel officer or something so that uh, the, the person reading it who's never been in the service will understand what what job it was that you had yeah don't say s1 or personnel officer say that you worked in human resources <laughs> There you go. As the, as the only non-veteran participating at the moment, I would agree, human resources. And for those of you that have spouses or civilian friends, ask them, read it aloud and say, does this make sense? Do you understand what I'm even asking? Because I can attest to what Ben said as living with someone who speaks in jargon. I didn't understand him for like at least three fourths of a relationship. So. Uh -huh. Esther, I'd, I'd like to just add one thing in terms of a source of uh, net networking and, and maneuvering in, in a new field. And that is, I, I received tremendous support through bar associations and, and uh, in, different, in different situations o over the years. Local bars, uh, na nationally, I got involved as a, uh, I was, I got involved while I was in the military through the American Bar Association. And through the National Bar Association, so both both of those provided me with a network of folks that were in the civilian world already, and so I, I was able to rely I was able to rely upon them early in my post military career, during my military career, and th throughout my life actually, and so I, I find that to be in just in, invaluable. I think one other thing to think about, Esther, is, is it's not just people who used to be in the military. We actually have a lot in common with people who used to work for the government or people who were in foreign service. So I think that when you're thinking about, as Amy suggested, reaching out to people, don't just say, like, don't, I mean, definitely don't stick to your own service. Don't say, oh, because well, I was in the Air Force, I should only talk to people in the Air Force. That doesn't, that doesn't really matter when you get out, but you can also include people who work for the government or, or foreign service or something else, because those folks you actually have a lot more in common with than you might realize. And they will similarly be open, I think, to speaking with you. This was so great. So next question, um, and Amy, this one I'm gonna start with you, is how did your military experience and or training prepare you for a career in the law? Yes, yeah, so I think all the speakers have already touched on this a little bit, but I, the biggest thing that the military brings is leadership early on. So, I mean, right, I left Chapel Hill and right out, right out the bat was commissioned, had leadership opportunities right out of college all the way until today. And I'm, it's been, I've been working a long time. We'll just leave it at that. But you have so much leadership opportunity and you have different types of de decisions you have to make. And a lot of it comes down to calculating risk, which a lawyer does every day. Um, so I think it's a different set of facts and different knowledge base that you're applying to it, but the skill set is there. 
Um, for me, I <clears throat> was in aviation and something happens in an airplane, you're, you can't panic because if you panic, you won't be able to get through it. So I found that law, you know, as an associate in a law firm, it wasn't, it was challenging. It was all new, especially writing because in the military, I never had to write. So any partner that worked for me with me as a junior attorney will re remember that I needed help writing, <laughs> but I didn't, my mind didn't panic because I was used to challenges and taking a deep breath and thinking it through. And so I was able to persevere. And I think that that shouldn't be underestimated because a new career is always going to be stressful, but the, the things you've tackled in the military, um, even with different underlying training, really gives you a good basis and percept, um, perspective to get through these new challenges in a legal career. And I do think the um, leadership shouldn't be underestimated. If you end up in a position in law where you're leading a team like I do now, I mean, you will find, I think Beth mentioned earlier, there's not as many law careers that give you that leadership opportunity early on that you would have had in the military and all leadership is translatable regardless of what your main job is. Thank you, Amy. Um, and so kind of going back to perhaps our audience who may be in law school, um, do you have any advice for veterans in law school with regard to choosing a practice area or a firm or an organization? Um, also, as a follow-up, um, a listener has asked if there are any panelists who knew of a practice area or practice areas that are popular with veterans or that you've encountered a lot of veterans working within that field. Um, how about Beth, would you like to tackle this one first? Sure. Um, so I think in terms of picking a practice area, you should try as much as possible to take a variety of classes in law school, see what sort of speaks to you. And when you find something that you think you like the law, please try to find someone who actually practices that area of law to speak to. Uh, law professors are wonderful people, but typically they didn't practice law for very long. And the actual practice of law versus the teaching of law are very different. And so you, you want to try to find an actual person who practices and your, your professor is going to know people. It's not that they aren't going to know people and they would probably be willing to talk to you for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, but I think the other thing to keep in mind is, is that whereas when you were in the military and yes, you made the choice to volunteer to be in the service. After that, you kind of did what the military told you to do. Keep in mind that selecting your career and selecting your firm or the company that you work for they're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. You have to get a good feeling for the place that you're working. You have to say, this is a place I want to go and spend a significant amount of my time. And so if it doesn't feel right to you, I don't think you would push it. I mean, I think that you should make sure that it's a good fit because that is one of the um, nice things about being in the civilian world, right? Is that you don't just have to kind of suck it up and do whatever someone told you to do. You can actually make a, a choice. And so I would say that you should be educated and you should be discriminating in, in the choice that you make. I'll just add, I don't know that there's necessarily a, and I'm, I'm thinking of this from my perspective, being on our, the hiring committee on our, our firm, I, we, we see a good amount of veteran candidates, but they, they are interested in all kinds of practice areas, litigation, corporate, regulatory, like, and, and, and plenty of people who don't know what they want to be when they grow up. And that's okay. I still haven't figured out what I want to be when I grow up. That's, I frankly think one of the nice things about a, a general commercial civil litigation practice is you can, you can have a lot of a variety and refuse to refuse to specialize in, in any uh, particular area. At least I've managed to do that uh, so far, but so, so try to find what, what you like and not what you think you're supposed to do because it fits necessarily with with what you did did before maybe it will and 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 you know there there are i mean obviously there are plenty of veterans who are like interested in national uh security law but we have folks who want to do m a deals and and um you know litigation pat patent law uh, you, you know you you name it um uh so uh, and and I would also I'm sorry I guess I said this already but uh, again from from the the big law bias but you know maybe look, maybe look at firms that give you some time to figure out what it is you want to to do long term and aren't uh, if if you don't really know for sure what practice area you want to go in 
where you where you get the opportunity to try out as a summer associate or as an associate different practice areas while you're while you're figuring out what it what it means to be a, a practicing lawyer. Thanks, Ben. Um, and Ben, I'm going to follow up with you, especially, um, you know, since you are involved within the hiring committee as um, does your corporation or in your case, your firm, but for other panelists firm, um, their corporations, um, do you have or are you planning a veterans resource group? And um, what do you think the value of that resource group is? And what are the benefits for the veteran and even the corporation and the firm itself? And is this something you use to attract veterans? And that's where we're getting to the hiring component. Um, so. Oh, well, work. thanks. Yeah, well, oh, well, I appreciate the I appreciate the question. Yes, we do. We have a veterans affinity group at the, at the firm. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the uh, one of the co-chairs of that, our, our Veterans Affinity Group actually has sort of a, a dual mission. One is recruiting and retention of of veterans, but really also of of uh, you know spouses of veterans, like a, you know a little community within a community at a firm, so so that there is some uh, mentoring and some that that's 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 available. So that's one part of what we do. But the other half of the Veterans Affinity Group, or the other part of our mission, is to encourage uh, folks at the firm to do veterans related pro bono work so our, our we have a, we have a strong and growing veteran cohort but the veterans affinity group probably is triple the size of the number of veterans at the firm because of the folks who are doing pro bono work with NVLSP um, and others that's been a long standing uh, you know pro bono practice is important it's very important at at Covington working with veterans has been something that's part of the firm's history and we're really trying to uh, to continue that, encourage folks um, um, to do that. Uh, um, how do, and how does that help? Look, I think how does that help the firm as a whole? Look, I, I mean, at some level, there's a little bit of bridging the civilian military divide. I don't know that it's really a divide, but people are interested. What did you do in the service? We we do a we do a every vet every year in November. We'll have a firm wide speaker who will speak on a, on veterans related. Uh, issues years ago, Ron Abrams uh, from NVLSP came and spoke. We've had we do a we do a slideshow of folks at the firm who were veterans or have you know are the children of veterans or spouses or um, a, a, a veterans with with those and it, it's sort of you know it it's the ties that bind us and all right I'll get off my soapbox but in these days the ties that bind us it's important to emphasize those and uh, and connect with those so I think that's been one of the uh, one of the virtues of the Veterans Affinity Group at the firm. Well, your soapbox work, box worked. I'm I'm ready to come on. Yeah, November I was, was going to start humming "Battle Hymn of the Republic" or so. So I'll, I'll just stop. Now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and everyone thanks you for that. Um, <laughs> so um, let's um, talk about recruiting a little more and um, veterans coming into the legal profession. Um, Will, do you think that the legal profession would benefit from recruiting more military veterans? If so, do you have any advice for the employers that might be listening with regard to best practices in veteran hiring? A ab absolutely. And my most of my career has been in government. And, and so uh, you know, I spent five years as a general counsel at, uh, at VA which is the largest civilian agency in, in government. Um, so, in, and in there we had over, we had about 700 employees in the Office of General Counsel, about 400 attorneys. So a, a lot of folks, a lot of them were, were veterans. Uh, we benefited for, because of the reasons that people have already spoken to. The fact that in the, in the military, you had folks that, uh, were put in ma managerial and leadership positions early on. Uh, you were also uh, dealing with people who were problem solvers. You were also, uh, when you deal with veterans, you're dealing with people that have handled stress, had to handle stress. And so all of those things are, are beneficial. I, but, you know, since my uh, you know, background is a little bit different than that of, of others here, people that went into law after their military career. I can tell you that as a uh, judge advocate and a military law focus, that 
that was a culture that called definitely had a strong emphasis on problem solving and a strong emphasis on simple communications. And that was something that, uh, and, and a client focus. So those were all things that I was doing from basically my first day as a JAG. I was, I was interacting directly with client. There wasn't uh, any kind of buffer uh, in, in, in between. And I quickly found out that people weren't that concerned or all that interested in my ability to spot issues as is something that uh, we got to specialize in, in in law school, but they were interested in how are we going to solve my, my problem and how are you going to talk to me, communicate with me in a way that I can easily understand. All of those things are things that are cultivated I think regardless of what you do in the military, certainly as, as a military lawyer, in terms of best practices, I, I, I think I would, uh, I would just encourage people to know that those experiences are, tr are transferable to the to veterans and the military members. What I want them to do is, again, what's already been suggested, let's translate your experiences into terms that uh, civilians can understand. So let's get away from the acronyms and such, and let's make sure that folks can understand what it is that, that you're saying. And know that, and as far as the civilians, be they firms or corporations or government uh, leaders who are in a hiring capacity, they should just know that when you're talking about the United States military and people that serve there, you're talking about people that have dealt with very complex problems and programs and systems that were worth a whole lot of money. So they they dealt in such environments from very early on. And I, I agree with Will. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind is, is that um, the military by and large is, is kind of a, a younger group of people, right? So when you're 40 years old and you're in the military, everybody's looking at you like you're ancient. The reality is that's not how it is outside. When you get to the outside, I regularly work with attorneys. I mean, I don't know that I want to work for this long, but I regularly work with attorneys that are in their late 60s or early 70s. And they still want to work and they still come to work every day and they love their practice. So don't think that just because you spent five or 10 or even 20 years in the military that somehow going to law school, you're, you're necessarily going to be too old. Now, having said that, you will feel old in law school because a lot of the people in law school are really young. But the reality is when you get out of law school, you will join a, a group of people who continue to work and think and practice you know, very far into their, you know, many decades beyond how old you are. So I would just encourage you, if you're interested in it, I think you can do it and don't, don't think you're too old. Because um, I, I know I went to law school at 27 and I felt ancient. And then when I got out of law school, I was like, oh, I'm not really that old. And, you know, so that was just something I think is important to keep in mind. Amy, do you want to, Amy, do you want to add on this or is it okay? Because I, I, I oh, want to pile ahead. on. Too. Okay. Um, uh, I just, I think um, what, what veterans bring to, to the workplace, uh, you know, present company, excluded but but the the folks that you know i'm thinking of uh, a lot of the newer associates that we've hired or summer associates in the last few years um i mean in, in, an incredibly diverse group of folks with a, a, amazing life experiences mis accomplishing missions working as a team like like um you know veterans enrich the diversity of any work force um that they join. So I think uh, there, I think there is a demand to hire veterans, and and there and there should be. Um, I I also want to say that at least as law firms go, of course, you're not going to get hired just because just because you are a veteran. You have to demonstrate um, strong abilities as as a lawyer or a future lawyer. You need you know do well in school, be interested in the law, um, want to do the work. I'm again, I've got the big law lens on but want to do the kind of work that we do but if if, if, if you're doing those things and you have that um, prior background and, and experience um, you 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 add so much value uh, 
to, to the workplace. So I'll soapbox back off. All right. Thanks, Ben and Will and Beth. Um, so in so one of the next questions is one that one of our registrants asked, and it really resonated me with, with me as a military spouse. Um, how are our panelists supporting employment of not only veterans, um, but the entire family, i.e., you know, the spouses of active duty and veteran members of the armed services? Ben? Uh, I I mean, I'll start just to, I, as I mentioned, you know, our Veterans Affinity Group is open to anyone sort of interested in veterans issues. So that it, it, our membership includes um, several military uh, spouses. One way a firm can can support that is if somebody, uh, particularly firm with offices in multiple locations, is if somebody gets orders um, to switch coast, then maybe the uh, associate, I'm thinking of one of my friends whose wife was an Air Force pharmacist and started in DC and then she got orders out out west and so he transferred to our our, our San Francisco office you know because it's it's it, it's one firm and to realize that that uh, you know that those sort of things th those sorts of things uh, may happen we, we try to um, uh, support uh, and and the there's a, a terrific veterans career lawfare I which I don't know, I may have may have been on a hiatus for the pandemic, but I know that uh, I know NVLSP has interviewed before that the work firm sponsors that other firms sponsor. Uh, we've interviewed folks there who are, you know, that's open for folks in the military, but also military spouses who have uh, moved around, you know, to understand and appreciate that there's a reason why the resume has got so many different uh, stops on it. And that that's uh, gosh, if, if being in the military is tough, being a military spouse is probably the toughest job uh, on the planet. These these are people that can add tremendous value. Be be on the lookout for them and try to find them. That's that's how that's how we can support that. Well, that was my. Add, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say this. It's a little. It's not exactly on point, but I will say um, maybe partially for the pandemic, but I know my company and a lot of others have a lot more flexibility to where you actually sit in the world versus, you know, where you're working. So the, one of the first things I thought of with that was how it would help spouse, military spouses, because now granted with the law, you have to be licensed in jurisdictions, but that aside, like um, a lot more and more companies are allowing flexibility to work from anywhere. And I, um, I think that's happening at least in, in-house legal functions. Um, so it's, that sh I would hope should help a lot of the spouses as well. Thanks, Amy. And yes, I have taken three bar exams um, in my <laughs> five years of practice. So, <laughs> um, and um, piggybacking on you, Amy, again is, um, so when you were choosing a place to work, did you personally look to see if your future employer employed other veterans? Um, were you concerned about whether they gave back to the veterans community? And um, did the answer to either of those questions play a role in your decision to work and stay there? Yeah, so when I first came out of law school, kind of what I touched on before, I I wasn't necessarily determined I was that I was going to work somewhere that had other veterans, but I did, in addition to the way the law school recruiting Law, you know, law firms recruit out of a law school. I participated in that, but I also, on my own, sent letters to veterans that I would see on law firms sites, sent my resume, a little bit about myself. I mean, I, and I will be, I mean, full disclosure, I probably sent hundreds more than I actually got feedback from, but I did get feedback. And I got people that either were hiring and would interview me or hiring, not hiring, but wanted to help me and advise me. Um, so I, I, I did that. I was certainly I was a little bit nervous about what stere what people would think of military um, folks, and I, you know, wanted to make sure that there were other lawyers out there, right? It's like we talked about before, there's not a ton of them, and I wanted to make sure they understood how we would fit in. I'll say in my current role, I was actually um, they reached out to me 
and because of my military background, because my internal client at the time had happened to have been a West Point graduate. He flew in the army. Um, and I, so I do, I support a lot of public sector business, government contracts business. which on the sales side and the business side happens, has a lot of veterans. And so the fact that I would have that in common with my clients was appealed to them. And so it was because of my military background that I was recruited for that position. So um, it wasn't a thing I specifically set out to do, but I was very, I very, I tapped into the network as best I can. And I really recommend that because um, there are lots of people that are willing to help you um even if they can't hire you right now i i learned so much from the people that were willing to talk to me um that had gone before me so to speak thanks amy mm -hmm. um, can i add esther can i just add one thing or maybe maybe two to that um absolutely that, uh one would be for folks who want to continue who are who are thinking of continuing in the in the reserves um, you know, because again, we're talking paths less traveled Then there are even fewer folks who are doing reserve military, whether it's reserve JAG or reserve other things and, and also, you know, working full time in the, uh, the civilian sector, but, but, uh, seek out folks who are doing that in the field that, you know, that, that you're choosing and, and talk to them about it. I think th that's a tremendous resource. It can be done. Um, and, and that's, that also is a huge, uh, value add. And then, and then I do think at some level you, you know, probably parts of what you both liked and parts of what you liked about the military, hopefully liked about the military is, is something you may be looking for in an employer. Is there, is there a, is there a sense of mission and purpose at the, at that company, at that firm? Is there, um, a, a sense of teamwork and cohesion? Um, you, you, you know, I, I, I still have a hard time, uh, in the law firm environment in the, in the army, it was easy to know who was in charge. Cause you could look at the insignia on the hat or the, uh, the lapel and, and in a law firm, uh, you know, there, there isn't a, a rank structure. That's, that's actually very freeing. Uh, but it's something that, that, uh, takes getting used to, to it. You want to be looking for, for the environment where you're going to feel, you know, feel, feel comfortable and, and appreciated in that regard. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, so Beth, in addition to employing veterans, um, does your firm have a pro bono program? Um, and in particular, does that program do veterans work? So my firm actually has an extensive pro bono program. Um, in addition to doing uh, civil litigation and criminal defense work. We also do uh, appeals for veterans claims, disability claims, um, mm -hmm. to the uh, Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, which is where your case goes after the VA denies you benefits, you can you can appeal your case to the CA, we call it the CAVC. Um, and it's a program that my firm's been doing for 10 years, and we actually just did our thousandth appeal. So um, we've been doing it for a long time and it's a great opportunity for the younger folks to you know have a client someone they can speak to on the phone they write the briefs um, occasionally they do oral arguments um, and so it's a it's a great program um, I uh, I've been leading that program sort of we have someone who is actually very knowledgeable about veterans law who does most of the hard work but i've been leading that aspect of the program for a number of years and we've recently added uh, discharge upgrade cases through nvlsp and so um it that's a nice opportunity for the associates because it's a little bit more like a trial court you know you can kind of add new evidence as opposed to being an appeal where you're sort of stuck with whatever's in the record um but i think that the goal of our pro bono program is to uh give folks an opportunity to work on something that's of interest to them. And one of the things I find particularly interesting is, is that there are a lot of people who want to work on the veterans program and want to help veterans who have no connection to the military whatsoever, but they are um, very appreciative of veterans and they want to, um, want to have an opportunity to serve those who they, um, who they feel have served our country. Thanks so much, Beth. 
I'll have to introduce you to some medical retirement soon. <laughs> and pro, um, pro bono is such a such a win win for all of us, but but for firms. Sorry, Esther. But um, and and particularly if you get to partner with an organization like EdVLSP that has the subject matter expertise to ensure that we're as we're doing the pro bono work, we're do, we're doing it well, and if we it can help us course correct if we're you know if we need some subject matter expertise these are great opportunities for younger lawyers to to take ownership of cases and get to get to work with uh individual clients and and i i i hope that everybody listening no matter what they go on to do and where they go on to do it um considers um trying to find an opportunity to to work on a pro bono matter uh, for a veteran at some point in time whether that's you know volunteering at a clinic or taking on a as Beth was saying, a CAVC case. There are lots of, I think, I think, I'm pretty sure if I'm, HP is doing, you know, their employers are doing cases. That, uh, pro bono work is not just for law firms. Uh, that, you know, major corporations do this too. This is such a win-win. Um, thank you so much, Ben. And um, one of the questions that has come up several times. Um, from registrants listening is that, are there um, any free resources where a veteran, particularly a disabled one, can learn about the law? Um, or does, if for those veterans considering law school, do any of the panelists know of schools that have military law or veterans law classes? Um, Amy, would you? Yeah, so, yeah, I am not familiar with a source for, the free legal training, um, certainly there's lots of organizations like MVLSP that will help veterans who need assistance for on a pro bono aspect. But there are law schools that will have veterans legal clinics. I think that would be a source to, you could look to that law school because they obviously have an interest in whether or not they have a full curriculum, they, their students are participating in law, learning that law in that regard. Um, there's a National Law School Veterans Clinic Consortium that'll list some law schools that um, participate in this. And um, there's also the bar associations that might have more information. I don't know if anybody has anything to add. So I can um, make a point, which is that there's something called the Equal Access to Justice Act, which is called EJA, which is a, it's a federal statute that allows if a, um, if a lawyer wins a, a essentially a, a, a part of a case or all of a case there's this opportunity to apply for um, funding to pay for the legal bills of the lawyer and so there are a lot of not a lot there are a number of smaller law firms primarily that operate on this business model which is where they take a case from a veteran and then when they win they apply for um, fees from the the um, equal access to justice act and so um, one thing that someone might consider is is reaching out to those types of law firms and seeing if there might be an opportunity for an internship or something along those lines I mean, if you're really interested in veterans law there is a, a subgroup of firms that specializes in it, and that may be an opportunity um, to consider kind of, you know, thinking back on it, a couple hundred years ago, you didn't even go to law school, right? You did an apprenticeship, and then eventually you learned enough to be able to take the bar. And so I don't think that there's reasons why you can't return, at least in theory, to something like that model to, if you're interested in a very specific area like, you know, veterans law and, and, and disability benefits. Thanks, Beth. That's great advice. Um, and so now I'm, unless anyone has anything else to add, I would like to take a second for each of you to think about um, one takeaway item um, that you hope that the veterans and people listening um, take away with them. And um, we'll go Ben, then Beth, then Will, then Amy. And um, so why don't you start, Ben? Are you on mute? I was, because I was worried that my phone was going to ring. Sorry. Um, I don't believe, but I was about to say something brilliant, I assure you. 
Um, <laughs> My my comment is that I don't believe there is there's no there's no right way or set path for someone to go from military service into the legal profession. There, I mean, think of how many think of how many different careers there are in the military, and think of how many different uh, careers there are in in law, and and then you do the combinations and permutations thereof. But but just know that um, that the skills you developed and the lessons that you learned. Uh, in service uh, should should and will be a tremendous um, asset to bring uh, to the practice of law. And so for those who are, are sort of, for those listening who are, are kind of embarking on that at the beginning part of that journey or that transition into the legal field, I'm just super excited for what's, what's in store for you because I know you're going to go forth and do great things. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. I, I think the thing that I would encourage people to do is to intentionally build your network. When you're in the military, uh, you know, it's a it's a small, it, it feels like a small world. You're, you know, you kind of get into your career field and you might run into the same people. You might end up seeing people. It, it doesn't work that way outside of the military. And so I think it's important for you to, and it may seem silly, but it's important for you to start a LinkedIn page. You know, make connections with the people that you're in law school with. You don't know where those people are going to end up. Um, and if you decide to stay at a firm long term, having a well-developed network of people that you either know from the military or that you know from law school, it, it's an incredibly great resource moving forward. But it is something that requires that you consciously do it, start it early, and tend to it regularly. Um, you know, you're in a city and you have a free evening, you can search on LinkedIn to see who you know who lives in that city and you can have an opportunity to maybe grab a drink with them or catch a meal. Um, but again, I think you just need to, you need to think consciously about building your network and that's something that you can start doing even in law school. Thanks, Beth. Will? Yes, uh, I, I very much appreciate and agree with what, what I've heard thus, thus far. I, uh, I, I want to encourage people to follow their hearts. There, there is no, I agree that there is no magic path uh, to doing the right thing because we're all different. We have different interests. We have different backgrounds. Uh, if you're interested in an area, it does start uh, with respect, I, I guess even before law school, looking into uh, programs and opportunities that, that you think you might enjoy. Look at law schools that, that appeal to you. For those folks that said, you know, I really want to serve other veterans, there are an increasing number of law schools that have veteran law clinics. M myself, I knew pretty, pretty early on that I would learn a lot better by uh, clinical experiences, opportunities to go to into court while I was in law school. So I looked for opportunities while I was in law school to get credit as, as I learned by, by doing. And schools that, uh, that encourage that, I, I encourage folk to look, to look for su such opportunity. I agree wholeheartedly with Be what Beth was saying about building your networks. I, I take it a step further and, and I would say that all life is relationship driven. And I, I look at networking as just a part of that because I've been in so many settings where people are exchanging cards and nothing really happens. A network is not built based upon the exchange of cards. I was fortunate enough to be a White House fellow. And in that process of applying for that program and, and going through the, the process of going through us, uh, semifinals or regional finals and then national finals, I asked one of my mentors, I said, well, I don't work rooms very well. And he gave me some sage advice that has worked very well for me. And that says, don't worry about working the room. If you click with somebody, talk to that person until it doesn't feel like, hey, well, this, this uh, conversation is petered out, then go, go to someone else. And, and I look at that just from the standpoint of, again, relationship building and not how many friends you can have on Facebook, how many people you can be linked in on, on link, link to on LinkedIn. Do those things, yes. But I know myself just recently, I was uh, 
I had a conversation with a young, uh, a young lawyer who reached out to me after asking to be linked on LinkedIn. And, uh, and I was just very impressed with her follow through because oftentimes someone will send a uh, request via LinkedIn and then nothing happens other than they're part of my LinkedIn network. Uh, so I would say if somebody's doing something that's interesting, then definitely follow up. I have two books to recommend that are uh, perhaps a bit dated, but they've worked very well for me that, that deal with this topic. One is called Never Eat Alone by Keith Barazzi, and it talks about making the most of your time and, and pursuing your networking skills. Another is called Dig Your Well before you're thirsty and it's by Harvey McKay. And again, it talks about you know, how do you network? And for me, as a lawyer, the most powerful networking tool that I've had is just being involved in bar, bar association activities and following up. People that I've interacted with have turned out to be just incredible resources throughout my career. Thanks so much. Well, I think everybody's touched on anything I would probably say. I definitely agree with the networking piece. I would say, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, the, most people actually want to help other people um, that are junior in their career or trying to make career decisions. If you hit, you run into someone who doesn't want to, then go to the next person because they will. The other thing I'll say is, don't underestimate how your service will translate to something beneficial. We've talked about that throughout this session, but the judgment calls you have to make, the leadership opportunities you have, um, the risk calculation you're doing all the time, the ability to work under pressure, all that thing, all that that's in the military will serve you well in a legal career. If you need help translating the specific skills to a legal resume, they're, you know, Again, ask your network and get get help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. That's those are my big takeaways. Well, thank you all four of you. It's been a real pleasure listening to you, and um, we hope everyone enjoyed the panel as much as I did. So thank you all. Thanks so much, Esther. Thanks for having us, and thanks for thanks for all you do and all the good work NVLSP does. Thanks, Esther. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it.
that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of the presenters and NVLSP, thank you for joining.